program. Um, our Twitter handle is at WACPHILA, W-A-C-P-H-I-L-A. Uh, so feel free to uh, tag us. Um, I'd like to tell you about some of our upcoming programs. It's uh, quite a list, so bear with me as I, as I go through them. Um, in the coming months, we have a few more programs like this where you can use your lecture pass if you're a member with us. Um, next Tuesday, on March 20th, uh, we have a program on India as a geopolitical and economic force in the 21st century. Um, on Wednesday, April 4th, we'll have a discussion about the effects of mass migration um, and what the effect has had on the European Union. Um, then, in another installment of our Young Friends program series, on May 2nd, we have confirmed an event as part of Philly Tech Week 2018 called the Bitcoin Bubble and Other Global Cryptocurrency Conundrums, um, where we'll take a look at the positives and negatives of digital currencies uh, and how they're affecting the future of our world. Um, on Tuesday, March 27th, uh, we have the distinct honor of hosting the Honorable John Kerry, the 68th Secretary of State at Villanova University. Uh, and on May 8th, we will host Yanis Varoufakis, the former Minister of Finance for Greece, uh, who will recount his time in office and discuss his thoughts on the economies of our post-2008 world. Um, and in June, uh, we will be holding a discussion on criminal justice reform and decarceration efforts at Eastern State Penitentiary. Uh, and later that month, to round it all out, um, we welcome Tarana Burke, who is the founder of the Me Too movement. Um, so a full calendar, to say the least, um, but we hope you'll join us again for uh, one of those important programs. Um, at this time, I'd like to welcome Tessel Thomas, uh, who is a member of our Young Friends Steering Committee, uh, to introduce tonight's panelists and to uh, run the show. Thanks, Tessel. Thank There's no mic here. <laughs> um, I hope you guys can hear me. How's everyone doing tonight? Good. Good. Uh, well, as Maggie mentioned, I sit on the Young Friends Steering Committee. Uh, we are a group of young professionals in Philadelphia who, um, well, I wouldn't say just Philadelphia, we have people from the suburbs as well who come in, um, and we help to put together events like this. We also brainstorm ideas to bring in more young professionals to get involved um, at the World Affairs Council. I'm excited uh, to be here tonight and to welcome our uh, speakers. Um, first we have on my left side here, well it's on my right side, but <laughs> he's on the left, um, uh, Professor Robin Mitchell Boyask. Um, he is from Temple University and he's actually the chair of the Department of Greek and Roman Classics. Um, he teaches courses in Greek and Latin languages, classical mythology, and ancient epic and Greek theater. Uh, he's also an avid baseball fan. Then in the middle we have Professor Devin Patel. He is an associate professor and chair of the Department of South Asian Studies at University of Pennsylvania. His focus is on the language, literature, and culture of South Asia, particularly Sanskrit, Indian languages, Indian literatures, philosophy, and translation theory. Um, interesting fact about him, he used to write, I don't know if you're familiar with the Babysitter's Club, he used to write the back covers for some of these books. Awesome. Awesome. <laughs> uh, finally, we have uh, Professor Vasu Ranginagathan. Um, he's a lecturer in Tamil in the Department of South Asian Studies at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, he's, he's originally from Tamil Nadu, and he speaks the language fluently. Um, his interests include the application of technology for language teaching and learning, historical linguistics, and medieval Tamil bhakti literature. Um, and he loves to travel around the world. I'm gonna let each of them talk a little bit more about their backgrounds, but uh, first of all, um, uh, join me and um, put your hands together in welcome, welcoming these to see you. There's very few places you can go where you get called esteemed for being a, for a scholar of Sanskrit. Thank you. This is one of the few places. I appreciate it. Um, so yes, uh, um, as Tesla said, I, I teach courses in literature, philosophy, and mythology, which uh, in the South Asian context, and actually if you go back to a very ancient period, extending from what we think of as modern-day Central Asia, Afghanistan, and that area, 
down to the countries of South Asia, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Nepal, Bhutan, India, Sri Lanka, and even further east uh, to the countries of Southeast Asia, um, you know, Thailand, Bangkok, um, Cambodia, Singapore, Malaysia, Laos, etc. And through the process of the travel of Buddhism and other sciences from 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 uh, South Asia all the way up to China and Mongolia. This is the whole cosmopolis, if you will, the world that Sanskrit once was part of that whole world. It's the most voluminous literature that we have next to classical Chinese, ancient Chinese, in terms of the number of volume materials. There's still, by some accounts, 30 million manuscripts that haven't even been looked at that exist in the world somewhere, in different places. Uh, and it covered everything from uh, literature, linguistics, philosophy, to mathematics, the, the natural sciences, gemology, falconry, horticulture. You can think about the sciences that, of the ancient world. Everything was in Sanskrit. So this is a major uh, cultural force. And it's been, uh, you know, it's on the interface of being you can think of it as dead, living, or never alive. <laughs> however you want to think about whatever, however people think about languages. Uh, it's part of uh, what, ling what linguists, and, and, and Vas was an expert in this uh, historical linguistics, it's called in what we think of as the Indo-European language family. This is a uh, reconstructions of languages, and they think of languages that uh, extend as far westward as Scandinavia, <laughs> Old Celtic, and as far east as India, Sanskrit, encompassing Greek, and Latin, and Persian, and all these languages, Church Slavonic, all these languages of the ancient world have some relationship grammatically, and their structures of society, mythology, etc. So this is why Sanskrit is even known to people. It's been studied in America and Europe since the beginning of the, the university structures in both of these regions. So old European university study had some, you know, uh, from at least the uh, 18th since, uh, 17th, 17th, 18th centuries onward in different places. Um, Penn has been teaching it since the um, early 19th century. Harvard, Yale, a lot of places had it. So, uh, but the language itself was the beginnings, the discovery of it was the discovery, was the beginning of this kind of historical linguistics, religious studies, because now we had all these religions that were written about in this language. So Hinduism, all the scriptures and, and, and the literary narratives of Hinduism, uh, Buddhism, uh, and Jainism, and other, and other smaller traditions that you may or may not have knowledge of. So all of this is in Sanskrit. Now, it's, it's living in the sense that, well, it's dead in that it's dead like we speak of other, like, like Greek being a dead language. It's not spoken. I agree. This is, this is how people speak about these languages here. But that somehow it's not, um, you know, uh, a, a, a language that, that the babies grow up learning. Classical Sanskrit. And I'm, I'm thinking about classical Greek in that sense. But uh, some would argue that it's never, it was never a language like that. Sanskrit perhaps was always a language which, outside of its earliest genesis, which was unknown, perhaps, you know, people speculate um, that the earliest literature that we have in Sanskrit is, in fact, the oldest literature we have of any Indo-European language. This is the Veda, the early Rig Veda, which goes back, you know, at least by the most conservative estimates, the uh, middle of the second millennium, third millennium before the common era, so 2,500, 2,000, BCE, whatever. I don't know about the dating. I'm always confused how they date these things. Um, but the language was always learned with other languages. So even now, when people are learning Sanskrit, they have their mother of tongues. But they, it's a language you, that you go to school for, and you learn sort of like modern standard English. You don't grow, come out of the womb speaking that. You're, you have to go to school, get trained in grammar. <coughs> Sanskrit's like that. So whether it's dead, it's not dead. There's hundreds of journals. People are writing poetry in it. They still can converse in it. You know, people, mostly academics, but also, and there's a new revival movement to make it 
speak again, you know, uh, in, in ordinary uh, places. And there are, there's a whole village actually in uh, southern India and Karnataka, uh, which uh, suppose, you know, I've been visited, but it's not really true, but uh, everybody's speaking Sanskrit in it. It was kind of, it began as a kind of a small local movement. And uh, it's living in that direction. So uh, there's a lot to discuss, but I think that's a good beginning. I'll leave some time for everybody else to right. say some words about their languages. Mm. Who's next, Yeah. Oh. Uh, it's interesting. I, I was actually one of the things I was doing this afternoon was looking at my mythology syllabus because I teach classical mythology a lot, Greek mythology, and I'm trying to figure out which is an. I've been doing it for a long time, so I pretty much know every virtually every minute is accounted for. And one of the things I'm trying to do is whether I can squeeze in some comparative material from the Mahabharata, um, because uh, one of the uh, aspects of seeing both uh, uh, the Greek culture uh, and Sanskrit culture uh, as part of the Indo-European family is that once you're aware of this, you see connections and parallels. Uh, so, that, so there's some moments in um, the Odyssey uh, and in the Iliad uh, which look very, very much like some moments of the Mahabharata. And, you know, 250 years ago, uh, scholars, you know, European scholars, tended to believe that the Greeks invented themselves. And, as they say, sprung uh, fully armed out of the head of Zeus. <laughs> uh, and that was partly a self-serving belief because these scholars tended to think that the Greeks looked like them and thought like them and didn't have anything to do with those other cultures around the Mediterranean who they didn't see as being equal to the Greeks. Uh, and this was partly influenced by something which has actually been in the news a bit the last year or so, um, which is the effect of the white marble statues that had been left over, which weren't white when the Greeks were looking at them, they were painted. And so um, Germans would look at, the, in the 19th century, would look at these uh, uh, white sculptures, marble sculptures, and think that, well, they're white because the Greeks were white. Well, they are, they're European, but they don't look like Nazis, um, so to speak. I'm getting off track, so. Uh, uh, but anyway, so then various things happened, like the Gilgamesh tablets were discovered, which showed that um, things we thought were unique to Homeric epic were actually came out of um, the equivalent of ancient Iran or Iraq um, and uh, connections to the Mahabharata and so on and so forth. We started to take reference in Rika's histories to trips to Egypt a lot more seriously uh, than they had before. And so now when, when people think about the Greeks and the Romans, they look really uh, uh, much more at the way those two cultures uh, interfaced with uh, the rest of the world. I mean, the Romans, I mean, the Roman Empire was arguably the first multicultural uh, civilization. And uh, uh, to the point where uh, graves of Roman soldiers in Roman Britain, which have been excavated and they've tested the DNA, they've actually found a fair amount of African DNA in ancient Britain, which has made um, white nationalists in Britain very, very unhappy. Um, <laughs> So to speak. Anyway, so but today, today is actually a big day for people who study ancient. <coughs> What's today? Today is the Ides of March, right? Exactly. Today's the Ides. You wear the Ides of March, right? Um, actually, uh, I've been chair on and off for a long time, and I'm more of a Hellenist, uh, somebody who studies the Greeks, and uh, uh, I tend to want to be naughty with job candidates on the Roman side of the department. So one of my naughty questions is, how do you feel about Julius Caesar? Uh, because this is the kind of thing which people don't want to talk about in public very much. If, if they sort of like Caesar, I mean, he's the man who killed the Roman Republic. Uh, but uh, he was arguably the greatest man who ever lived. <laughs> so uh, he raises all kinds of questions for democracy. What do you do when you have something who is superior to everybody else around him? Do you let somebody else hold power? Which is actually a question which exercised the Greeks as well. Anyway, talk a bit about language here first. You know, all, you know the saying, 
Uh, Latin is a dead language, it's very plain to see. It killed off all the Romans, now it's killing me. Well, <laughs> well, uh, Deb mentioned uh, uh, attempts to make uh, uh, San Sanskrit spoken, right? Uh, uh, living Latin is, is arguably the fastest growing part of, of, of the study of Greek and Latin now. There are, there are conventions where people get together a couple times a year and do nothing but talk Latin to each other all weekend. Uh, and you have to come up with really fancy Latin phrases for things like World Wide Web or Internet or phone, <laughs> right? Um, but it's really, really quite interesting that way. And the reason I, I, I kind of guffawed at the idea that Greek is necessarily a dead language, well, there's lots of people speaking Greek in Greece. Uh, uh, modern Greek is more like ancient Greek than modern English is like Chaucerian English. Okay, so there is, there is a, within Greece, there is an astonishing uh, continuity uh, in the language. Now, it's the same alphabet, the same, uh, a lot of the same words. I mean, I can read, a, I, I, I've never studied modern Greek formally. I know if you've asked for a few things in modern Greek, uh, uh, but I can read a menu, I can read every street sign because the vocabulary is exactly the same, or the words are the same. Uh, it's quite conservative that way, but it sounds completely different. In fact, one of the things that Hellenists argue about is whether we should pronounce ancient Greek more like modern Greek. Uh, you can get people really angry over that uh, in a hurry. It's amazing when people get angry at it, actually. Um, uh, I myself, uh, mainly uh, known as a scholar of Greek tragedy, uh, it was actually Athenian tragedy um, because uh, nobody outside of Athens actually made any of these plays. They were written by Athenians, for Athenians, uh, there may have been a few foreigners in the audience because it was a kind of a, a, an Olympic-like event, um, okay. but it was very much a, a, a theater which was about Athenian problems, even though all the plays took their subjects from <coughs> And trying to unpack what the plays meant to their, uh, their immediate audience is actually one of the, the main things we've been doing for the last 30 or 40 years. Um, it's not easy, but it's, it's, it's interesting and actually when, when you discover what, when you, get a, when you get a better idea of what exactly the original audience has found meaningful about them, you can actually understand why certain plays are better than others. Because the ones with the most energy to them, like Oedipus or the Oresteia, are the ones that really were most grippingly engaged with what was happening in Athens that particular I, I can go on for three hours at this point, so I think I'll, I'll stop myself. Because, uh, what but always remember is language. The word democracy means the power of the demos. Right? The demos is not everybody. It's the normal people. All right? And even for Athenians, it was a very ideologically loaded word. Because the people who weren't the normal people hated it and didn't understand why they had to share power with the riffraff. Uh, and uh, one of the mo when we worry about are we Rome, or what, you know, what can we say about Greek democracy, the most interesting thing to me about, those, about the relationship between the Roman Republic and us, and Greek democracy and us, is that both cultures lost that at some point. And they didn't have to lose it. So think about that. Thank you all. Um, speaking of a language being dead, I should say no. Um, being a Tamil speaker, I would say that I speak half Sanskrit, half Tamil. So that means in India, if you can think of it, all the languages are Sanskritized languages in one way or another. So the languages have their own mind. Somehow they don't find a family, they just go into, creep into another family. You know, that is how the Sanskrit has been living in India. Um, so what happened it was in you know, the history of Tamil started with the literature. <clears throat> Around 3rd century BC, there were about 400 <clears throat> Tamil uh, poets. They were all uh, writing poems and uh, take it to the kings and uh, get rewarded for that. And the kings will anthologize them. So that is how the classical Tamil uh, emerged. Um, we don't have the prehistory of Tamils. Um, they say that the Indus Valley is really the Tamil civilization, but um, we don't have uh, that kind of um, you know um, proof for that. 
But as far as Tamil is concerned, um, they, they, they think 3rd century BC to the 3rd century or 4th century AD is the real classical time where they didn't mix any Tamil, there, any Sanskrit there. They it, it were all pure uh, Tamil. They, they kind of um, mi mixed the natural world with the human world. If you look at any poem, you will see they start with uh, uh, some natural element and go to the human. So, for, uh, for example, they will say the flowers are blooming and the heroine is crying because the hero, uh, the hero left her, then the whole city is mocking at her. So, the, the meaning for the blooming flower is that the flower is mocking at the girl having left her um, hero. So, this is the way, they, almost all the poems, so they kind of mix the nature with the human world. Um, this is how the Tamils lived. I know um, there were, uh, the, uh, they have two things basically, Puram and Aham. Aham being internal, Puram being external. So, uh, internal means the love life and uh, external means the kings, um, warriors and the other um, aspects of life. Uh, so that is, then you also have didactic literature. Um, with, so if you can think of it, within that, that period, you have a classical literature period, there is a literary culture living there, then all of a sudden, it changed upside down. So until then, they were, pra they were praising the kings. Um, there, there is a word which will refer to the house of uh, the king is Koil. But the same word turned into a house of God is Koil. You know, so the, it's kind of a, and from 4th century AD onwards, it completely changed. The, the life of Tamils changed it's because Sanskrit came in and the Shaiva literature, Shaiva, Shaiva, Shaivism um, you know, developed there. All the kings patronized the um, Shaivism and the Sanskritized uh, culture. So that way, Sanskrit and the Tamil lived together from 4th century onwards. And um, the, the, the literature still grew, but the literature were mostly on uh, uh, God, not uh, king anymore. Um, so we have a medieval literature, which is called Bhakti literature. Then we have a classical literature, for during that 3rd century uh, BC to 3rd century AD. Um, recently, the Indian government um, gave sanction Tamil being the uh, classical uh, language. They had a classical institute in uh, Chennai, India. One of the things they say is that, now if you research on the classical language, classical literature that was written during that 3rd century BC to 3rd century AD, we will fund you. But if you do any research on the Bhakti literature, we will not fund you. So that means the literature after 4th century AD not, are not considered classical literature. So that is how the, the, there is a, the, the polemics between Tamil and Sanskrit uh, grew. Um, at, in 19th century, what happened was that there is a pure Tamil movement came in. So what happened was, uh, it's a, we call it um, um, uh, the, the garland being, it's, um, you alternate the um, uh, gems. So same way when you speak the language, you have it alternate the words, Sanskrit and Tamil. So um, that particular style of language, they did not like it. So after 19th century, that pure Tamil movement started taking the Sanskrit apart from the uh, Tamil language, and they wanted to have this, uh, the group of people who would want, we always want to speak the pure Tamil language. So that is how the modern world is living in now. Between the, um, the Sanskritized Tamil or the pure Tamil, or do you want to price on the card or price on the king? You know, which literature you want to stick with? So uh, that is the kind of li uh, uh, life Tamils are going through now. Um, I mean, if you, if you think about it, Sanskrit, when they came in, they, we had so much literature, Shaiva literature and Vaishnava literature. They also used uh, um, nature to price the card. So the same type of style they used during the bhakti literature. But the polemics developed. So that, that is what um, Tamil is all about so far. So we can now, uh, let me start here for now. Uh, just one thing to, just to clarify, I mean, um, just so you know, the, uh, I think maybe the people might not be aware, but 
uh, Tamil, the other language, Tamil is uh, that, that region is that is the very southern west coast of India. So it's kind of a it's it's sort of localized, but in, but that whole region is the classical period. Sanskrit doesn't have a geography. It's not really it doesn't have a place, even though they say it may have come through the northwest in the India or it was developed there. It's controversial, but that there's no specific locality and. Um, just the, by the point of view of the Greek, we actually know how Sanskrit is pronounced because they have uh, ancient text on phonetics. So there's a, the whole science of sort of phonemic, ling, like linguistics is sort of well developed. So we actually know the alveolar, the different, where you put your tongue in your mouth to form a sound and exactly how, and we can actually figure out why accents happen between, you know, because certain sounds, English speakers, for example, can't hear and Indian speakers can't hear certain sounds, so they try to reproduce them based on where their familiarity is. So we can have that now. That's a fun conversation. Yeah. But I just wanted to clarify that in case you didn't know where the where, where, where Tamil is kind of. Yeah, Tamil, Tamil is spoken in the southern part of India, and it is also an official language in uh, Sri Lanka, and uh, Singapore, and uh, several other um, you know Caribbean islands. You know, we have Tamil speakers there. So um, there is a long history uh, when the. Uh, um, the British and the French people um, came there and they, after this uh, slavery was abolished and uh, they took many people from Tamil Nadu and also from India, I think. So they ended, uh, you know, so they uh, worked in, uh, um, in the farms in many Caribbean islands. So there are all Tamils are all there, but they lost their language completely. Um, but in Sri Lanka and Singapore we have, uh, and Malaysia also we have lots of Tamil speakers. Um, one more thing about he was saying that there are, there are no Sanskrit speakers. There is a village called the Sanskrit village in I don't know Muttur, Muttur, yeah, yeah. in uh, Bangalore. So they, 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 you have many speakers who have native tongue as Sanskrit. Of course, the number is about fourteen hundred. <laughs> so fourteen hundred or something. A classical language as opposed to a modern language, and um, what parameters does a classical language have to be to be considered a classical language? Should I start with that? Okay, I'll, I'll start and then we'll go in the same order. Yeah, sure. um, uh, that's a good question. Uh, in terms of Sanskrit, um, they often divide up the language, which, you know, it would be like dividing English up into Old English and Middle English and Modern English and even then academic standard English, vernacular English, dialectical, whatever you want to do. So with Sanskrit, the divisions usually are, uh, there was this ancient ritual literature and hymns and that sort of thing, the ancient language called the Vedas, and that they call Vedic Sanskrit, because it, it's, you know, they have certain forms that are a little bit distinct from what develops into the classical Sanskrit. Uh, sometimes, the, you know, like the Greek, the pre-verbs, or, you know, they're kind of just separated from the like the preposition is separated from the main body of the word. Certain things like the subjunctive or are lost or there's various things are there. These, you know, linguistic features. So linguistic features classifies often this designations of classical. In the fifth century BCE, you had one of the great uh, uh, you know, linguists of the ancient world who in 4,000 little statements with a meta language, algebraic statements, <laughs> maybe like, you know, 10, 15 pages worth of text, he described the entire language, Sanskrit. Uh, um, pronunciation, vocabulary, grammatical structures, everything. Um, and it's one of the great monuments, sort of like a Turing machine of how you can, you know, create this machine. So afterwards it became such a popular thing that everybody wrote in that following those rules, as it were, even though they weren't rules, it was just a description of the language. And that became classical Sanskrit. So if you deviated from that description, from the 5th century BCE onwards, you were writing bad Sanskrit. And so that's why the language is very conservative in that way. For the next 2,500 years since now, you write in that particular, the standard has become the standard, which is why some people say it's an artificial language or a dead language, because it doesn't change anymore. You add more vocabulary and stuff, but doesn't the grammar doesn't change? Most languages that live 
are always changing. You know, I'm, it's like I'm gonna go, not I'm going to go. You know, these things that happen, language will evolve consistently. So the classical is linguistically is that. Thematically, there's certain literature and periods where you think of as like the kind of the uh, the density of text or the dense or a particular kind of things are developed and ideas, and that becomes classical and then it changes. So this is kind of one vision of the classical. Um. It's actually, for the, for the Greeks and the Romans, it's an extraordinarily limiting term. Uh, it, it tends to designate what is perceived, the, the literature which was composed during what is conceived to be the peak of the culture. Uh, it is in a similar way where things got sort of frozen linguistically. Uh, so for the Greeks, this really refers to uh, the fifth, than the 4th centuries BCE in Athens. That's it. Okay, It's very limited, yeah? I mean, the vast majority of texts we have were actually composed in Athens. But that means that Homeric epic is not classical. Right? Homeric epic uh, has a gestation period of hundreds of hundreds of years. The storytelling tradition until some point in the late 18th century, late 8th century BCE, maybe 7th. A lot of people disagree about this stuff. Uh, somebody or a committee uh, put together the form of the text that we have. And because this emerged uh, over a long period of time uh, uh, with uh, many different hands in the storytelling tradition, the Iliad and the Odyssey are composed in a composite of different dialects. So nobody ever actually spoke Homeric Greek. It's not classical. So by classical, we mean things like Sophocles, Plato, Aristotle, Demosthenes, um, authors like that. So for the Romans, uh, it really has to do with the first century BCE and the first century CE. Even though we have Latin from as far back as roughly 400 BCE, and as late as the 16th century CE, in terms of continuous tradition, um, all official documents in Europe were written in Latin until the 16th century. Uh, so, um, and that doesn't get studied. I mean, th there are people now, there's a kind of a Neo-Latin mo movement which is connected to the spoken Latin. Uh, but a lot of this stuff doesn't get read very much or, or studied. Um, so hopefully it will at some point. But by classical, we mean Again, a, a, a style, a linguistic style, uh, which is linked to what is perceived to be the apex of the culture, hmm. which feeds into all kinds of decline and fall narratives. Now, with the, what happened with the Greeks is that at the end of the fourth century, Alexander pushes the Greek world south and east, and he changes what it means to be a Greek. Hmm. Before, before that, Greek was an ethnicity, then it became a culture. Uh, so as he spread Greek culture throughout the world, they had to simplify the language that they had from Attic into what was called Koine. Koine means common. So it's the same vocabulary, but it's much simpler in terms of the syntax. So that's, that's so, so the Bible is written, the New Testament is composed in, in Koine Greek, because it was the way that the, that the authors of the Gospels could communicate with the widest audience. Because everybody in the Roman Empire, at least in the eastern part, spoke Greek, not Latin Greek. Um, to me, I would think that you know, it should be ancient. There should have enough literature. There should be creativity, and uh, it should be indigenous. You know, all of these uh, features, I think, would count uh, considering a language as a classical language. Um, like I said before, as far as Tamil is concerned. They consider only the literature that were produced between 3rd century BC and 4th century AD is classical because they, they were all indigenous. People thought on their own, they didn't borrow anything from any other language. But in the Bhakti literature though, they borrowed several uh, things, linguistically, culturally, religiously, they borrowed from Sanskrit. So that is why they didn't call the Bhakti literature being classical. But they call 
the Sangam literature, which is the ancient Tamil literature being classical. Um, you may have read Professor George Hurt's um, Hurt's um, you know saying about uh, what is uh, classical. Um, the, I think it should be ancient. You should have enough literature. Then there should be creativity and um, homegrown. And Professor George Hart was the one who wrote to the Indian government saying how Tamil can, how Tamil should be considered a classical language. Then following that, they accepted that. Then lots of money poured into Tamil Nadu. They, they considered Tamil being classical. Until then, they didn't consider that Tamil as a classical language. But this literature, you know, it's a, the Sangam literature, the Tamil classical literature, is the a, the example, the right, the right example for considering any language being a classical language. Of course, Sanskrit, you know, it, it has longer tradition than Tamil. It has um, so much literature than Tamil, but it has its own creativity. Tamil has its own creativity, but in during the medieval period, they mingled. It, of course, there is a domination factor is there. Um, so that cost. Uh, that particular piece of literature not being classical. So that is how I would think. Next question. Um, how did languages like the Sanskrit, Latin, or Tamil influence the languages that we have today? That's a good question. Again, that might have been. Um, and I don't know if the audience members will also get a chance. So um, there is what they call. Some scholar recently is called the vernacular revolution. I mean, we think of this word vernacular, it's kind of part of, from the European experience, but it's uh, just the map, the idea that you have a classical language, and then you have other classical languages. Sanskrit wasn't the only classical language of ancient India. There are what they call the Prakrits. There were several, about seven or eight, that we have an idea that we see in drama, actually, by a different characters speaking them. Uh, but there were other kind of languages that had their own grammar and literature. In, aside from Sanskrit. But by about the 10th, 11th century, you start seeing the development of regional local languages in India, which kind of developed their own literature, their own grammars. And those were are the, are the ancestors of the contemporary Indian languages, which of course, as, as, as Professor Nanathan has been mentioning, they're related to Sanskrit, but they're also related to local indigenous developments, and they're kind of combinations, and they're all kinds of new, like, you know, sort of romance languages and that sort of thing. But these languages are, uh, you know, um, uh, they're sort of have distinct cultures as well. So right now in modern India, <laughs> this was sh shocking, I mean, we think of India as a country, but it's really uh, like, you know, what's the size of Western Europe, in terms of acreage, but even culturally, there's 25 accepted national languages. 25 or 26 depends on how many you count, but over thousands and thousands of dialects. So these are all distinct languages as well. So it's a place of language. And so what's classical, what's not classical is a question that's being imported from another worldview. They're not, I mean, you know, we don't, I mean, this is a new thing, these, and the politics surrounding classes. But nobody in India was even now, less than bilingual, and most of them are trilingual. So everybody, you have to have, and, and this is one of the few places in the world, in world history, where language and identity were not connected. That's a modern development as well, connecting your language and your identity. Because people spoke different languages in different contexts, of what, what needed to be expressed, when, where, how. So you didn't associate that with your very being. That's a new thing. Uh, well, I have, I have the easiest one here, which is that basically, you know, Latin turns into Romance languages, right? So, <laughs> uh, and then you know, Greek uh, filters through uh, Latin into various things. But you know, with with modernity, uh, all basically entire scientific vocabulary is is Greek based, um, derived from Greek. So uh, that's how Greek survives that way. Should we take? Oh no! Should we just finish up? We're going to have questions at the end. Oh, okay. sorry. Um, let, let me finish, uh, finish this particular piece of um, dialogue. Um, for, to me, you know, uh, the, how the classical language affected the modern world, you know, um, uh, you know it, during the medieval period, Sanskrit dominated Tamil, Sanskrit came into Tamil, and uh, Sanskritized language, Sanskritized Tamil emerged, 
Then now in the modern world, we have uh, anglicized Tamil emerged. So we are actually speaking anglicized Tamil with a mixture of Sanskrit words in it. So as a Tamil scholar myself, I will be considered as a Tamil scholar only if I speak the pure Tamil. So when I go to, I have been invited several places and I will, when I go to that, those places, I have to be conscious that I shouldn't speak any, I shouldn't use any English word, also I shouldn't use any Sanskrit word. So it may be easy to get, 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 get rid of the English word, but it is very hard to get rid of the Sanskrit word because it has been with us since the medieval period. Um, so that is how uh, the modern world is looked at now in India. I mean, of course, English is dominant language. But now, then it was Sanskrit was the dominant language. So people would be very proud of speaking uh, uh, Sanskrit uh, language that time. Now everybody is proud of speaking in English in uh, um, in modern world. So that is how the language is influenced each other. Two more questions, and then we're going to turn to the audience. Um, Talk about language death and whether you think that there's ever a chance of any of these classical languages that you teach um, having a risk of dying. Uh, we often hear about dead languages, but do you think this is a misnomer? <laughs> I guess life and death is <laughs> who knows who's who's alive, who's dead, you know, move around. But uh, look, Sanskrit, there's faith amongst. I mean, it 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 cannot really ever die as long as any other Indian languages live only because um, Sanskrit morphed into, I mean, this is, people have argued that, yes, the creativity of Sanskrit, people are not as creative in Sanskrit anymore. They're not composing high philosophy in Sanskrit. And they're not only thinking in, in the language 24 hours a day, outside of a small minority. They're not producing. So if that's what, creati if that's what living means, then one wonders if it was ever alive. That's what I meant when I said that. Was it ever alive? Because if everybody's trilingual and bilingual, you know, they're speaking one way in the house, on the streets, you know, if they're buying a hot dog, and then they're speaking another way if they're giving a presentation on something, you know? So there's an always, so there's no fear of it's dying. But there is, I think your question is that there is a sense that with the pressures of the modern world, um, even awareness has, is diminishing generationally in certain contexts and um, even if people are using the words they don't know what they're saying you know, that's a common thing in many cultures and languages so that I I would say that there is that but fear is a also complex word <laughs> yeah. um, if, funny enough uh, people are probably reading Greek texts uh, in a higher number than the history of the world right now. They're reading them in translation, though. Uh, there are, there is, are, there must be at least a new one new English translation of the Iliad and the Odyssey every year. You know, it's really quite amazing. Uh, my friend Emily Wilson over at Penn uh, is, uh, is, is. You may have seen her in the New York Times, or I heard her on the radio, or. Uh, she's gained a fair amount of fame for being the first woman ever to translate the Odyssey into English, and if you don't think that's um, doesn't if you if you don't think that makes a difference, uh, follow her on Twitter because uh, she'll uh, uh, she'll do she'll launch a, she'll launch a thread where she'll uh, print the Greek, then do five translations by men, and then hers, uh, and often. Uh, you can see the men loading uh, various uh, uh, cultural values. Uh, which are quite heavily gender-based into, into that translation. So uh, as, as long as people are interested in the stories, uh, in, in, in the epics, in the plagues, uh, uh, the language, the Greek language itself is never going to die. It will be perhaps learned by fewer people. Uh, budget cuts are you know, always a fact of life. Uh, uh, but uh, good teaching can, uh, can counter a lot of that. Um, but uh, people are going to be reading Homer a thousand years from now. Um, there's a Star Trek episode, Next Generation, where at the end of it, Picard goes to his study and pulls the Epic of Gilgamesh off the, <laughs> off the shelf and starts reading it. Um, so there's hope for that. Uh, of course, that's not Greek. Um, uh, and then with Latin, as I said, uh, uh, spoken Latin is, is, is the single uh, fastest growing part of Latin studies. So um, I'm, I'm not too worried about that, actually. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think it's also true is that more people are reading Sanskrit literature 
and all. And the, I mean, there's so much of it. I mean, just to give you a comparison, it's a thousand times more than yeah. everything in Greek and Roman put together, in Latin put together. Yeah. It's just that much literature, but it's in translation and in, in the regional languages as well as in English. I mean, when a language is a literary language, I don't think there will be a fear of being dead. Um, but if you think of Indian, I mean, in the Indian context, there are so many tribal languages. They die every year. Uh, yeah, um, they, I mean, uh, they are trying to uh, make them literary by teaching them or uh, imposing them on the language of the vernacular and not their own language. It's because they don't have a script, they don't have literature, they don't, uh, the, the, it is, it is, the languages are uh, dying. But in my perspective, if I only think of myself, there are uh, three things. One, pure Tamil, Sanskritized Tamil, Anglicized Tamil. The pure Tamil is dead long, uh, long ago. You know, so the people are so um, angry about that. You know, it's happening there. You know, that is why they are trying to make that pure Tamil movement. And uh, they are trying to revive the language from the ancient world. And uh, you know, uh, getting uh, rid of all the mixer, all the loan, uh, the borrowings, and all th th that is happening. It, it is a kind of friction, but um, it is happening now. You know, the, the one genre of language is dead; the other variety is living. You know, we can think of that way too. Uh, what advice would you give them uh, regarding studying classical languages or just languages in general? Uh, go online, <laughs> email professors that are dying to teach you these languages. <laughs> There's a lot of online stuff available now as well. Uh, Antonia Rupel from Cambridge University, in fact, has done some stuff on YouTube. And in a different context, there's spoken Sanskrit groups as well if you want that. But uh, if, you, if you want the classical language, if you want the literary, there are, there are more, just like there's more people reading Greek now than ever before, there's more opportunity to learn Sanskrit than ever before. Um, we'll probably launch something at Penn soon, like a summer program as well, and you know, we're all available. <laughs> Night and day. Yeah, I think I, I, there, there's a, a woman in Minnesota who actually I think is teaching a free Sanskrit course on the internet. She, she's like a Hellenist who dabbles in the Mahabharata. So. Uh, dabble enough well know that another language. Uh, yeah, uh, the internet's just uh, fabulous uh, for if, if you're at, if you're past your official college days, um, uh, you can find courses online. There's a, a, a phenomenal organization in New York called Paideia, uh, P A I D E I A dot org, um, and they offer courses uh, online for very little money. Some of them may be even be f even free. Um, through various online exercises and video conferencing and things like that, they're they're uh, they're they're uh, they're fairly well funded. Uh, they actually are, are one of the founders is a Zuckerberg, uh, Donna Zuckerberg, who's Mark's sister, uh, who was a PhD in classics from Princeton. Uh, uh, so uh, yeah, so it's, it's, really there's much more opportunity now as as, as an adult uh, uh, or somebody who's at an educational institution which doesn't have. Uh, and there ever has been before. It's really quite remarkable. Yeah. There's a Sanskrit expression that there's uh, there's more teachers than students. Yeah. <laughs> as soon as as soon as the students uh, are, uh, emerge, the teachers. I mean, as soon as there's a student, there will be hundreds of teachers that will emerge. I mean, the, you know, uh, learning uh, and literature, you know, is so um, nice. You know, it's uh, but. Get to the literature is hard. You need, you need to learn the language. That, that learning the language part is so difficult. I've been teaching Tamil for a long time, but people would come and sit in my first year, if I begin with Tamil, and say that I want to read the literature from Sangam time, medieval literature and all. Okay, I will take you there, but halfway through, they will be gone. <laughs> You know, it's it's a, it's a learning the language is so difficult. Uh, but if you have the patience to go all the way, go for it. You know, um, we have wonderful literature in Sanskrit and uh, Tamil literature, of course, Greek and everything. To get to that, I mean, translations are there, but you have to feel it when you, only when you read the poem yourself. Yeah. You know, so the, you you can't really translate you need um, a literature to other language, you cannot get the same flavor. Mm. But if you want to get it, you have to go through this. 
and I have many students who would come and take the Tamil language and go immerse themselves in, the, uh, in India, in Tamil Nadu and come back and uh, learn it again. At one point, they will, be, uh, they, they will be the master of the literature and all. It happens, you know, it is possible. So it, it involves uh, uh, lots of work. There's also a new series is out where you can, um, there's the Romanized script on one side, the translation on the other, like, like, like Greek. Yeah. So you can kind of sound the words out, see them, hear them. Yeah, if you want to learn the Tamil language, we have our website, nice website, the datetamillanguage.com. You can go see that we have uh, several videos there. You can see how people speak in Tamil, and, all, and um, we have some literature also there. You know, just in case. Thank you. Let's open it up to audience questions. If anyone has any? Thank First, thanks. Uh, thank all of you for coming. This was a really interesting program. Uh, <clears throat> my question, which maybe belongs in the math department, is. Can anyone here trace the origins of the Indian number system whose descendants, of course, is the universal uh, decibel system that we all use? Uh, yes, well, script-wise, orthographically, India, I mean, Sanskrit doesn't have a script. Even though we, there's a traditional one that's used in, in the North Indian manuscripts that people have published and printed, it's Devanagari, but you can write Sanskrit in any script you want. In fact, um, there's been original texts during the British period in Roman. So there were Sanskrit texts written in Roman. The number, the, 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 if you're asking about the history of the notational systems, I mean, you know, like Mesopotamia and ancient Greece and India and Central Asia, they had a lot of networks of developing astronomy, mathematics, astrology, but the origin um, is a long history, the origin of the numerical system. But the, if you're thinking about the actual characters, those are descended from the Sumerian. The, the, all the Indian scripts are, are, are from Brahmi, even the southern, northern. So they're all from, they all migrated, just like the Roman and the Greek. Well, I'm not sure about the Greek, but the, the so the actual notations. Is that, um uh, Am I to saying that zero was invented from a Sanskrit right, idea? Like so the conceptualization of the uh, zero. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, like uh, I like said, we have our own uh, numbers, but we will still, uh, they, they, we have Tamil numbers also, but they don't use that anymore. We will go to the Arabic numbers. Um, that's how, like you said, you know, so the long, uh, the script, the orthography is different, the concept is different. Hi. Uh, oh, sorry. So, um, I was uh, curious if if you actually uh, work with uh, colleagues who um, are fluent in Mandarin uh, Chinese. Uh, in my mind, that's also um, a classical language as well. But um, the question I have is, what um, influence does it have it, it in your university? Um, and uh, do you also work? collaboratively uh, with uh, colleagues that, that actually speak uh, Chinese as well. Uh, yes, in fact, uh, Victor Mayer, who's one of the great scholars of classical Chinese, is at Penn. And he came, he said from, I think he was at Harvard, he came to Penn because there were so many Sanskritists here that he really wanted to work with. This was about 30, 40 years ago. Uh, the one distinction between Mandarin Chinese and other languages is that the standard is the written, right? Spoken may differ in the different regions of China, as far as I understand it. But the, it's, the, it's the writing system which kind of unifies this kind of system. Sanskrit, like I said, has no script. It's almost the exact opposite, right? That the spoken matters. It doesn't matter what, how you write it or how you represent it. It's just the, it's the syllables of pronunciation. And there are People do work. I mean, in fact, Penn used to be called, uh, the department used to be Oriental Studies. You asked about colleagues. Mm. This is before Oriental became a, a, an unhappy word in our parlance. So it got divided into all these regional things, East Asia, Near East, South Asia. But there were conversations being had in an earlier generation of scholarship between the, all of these different regions, which developed certain sciences and fields and disciplines and questions which maybe now aren't being asked anymore and they're being asked more locally like what is Sanskrit relationship to India not necessarily to Greek and uh, Chinese 
and similar kinds of things have happened in the in the disciplinary structures of the university. But that's again, everything is recent. I don't know if that quite captures something. Must be about temples. Like yeah, we don't, we don't, we don't really. Uh, we, we our, our Chinese program is relatively small. We don't do Mandarin. I'm fairly sure. Uh, we have no Sanskrit. <laughs> so uh, when it comes to say classical, we're pretty much the only game in town. We have 600 people. 600 students learn, wanting to learn Mandarin Chinese. Yeah, just per just semester, to just to learn the language. So it's quite popular. It's, it's gaining very popular. Yeah, yeah, Chinese. yeah. We 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 get Chinese uh, taught, um, but this uh, uh, our, our budget's a bit more limited. Let's put it that way. Yeah. So uh, thank you for this very interesting conversation discussion. Um, the these languages have their uh, essentially their inception. Um, very, very early on in human history, right? All of these, um, and and I, I'm assuming they, they started as an oral tradition and then moved to a written tradition. My question, um, and I, I'm not hopefully you can answer, it, um, is that transition. Um, can you talk about how that impacted human beings, uh, their day to day lives, and and society generally? Um, just, you know, uh, yeah. The transition from oral to written, is that Oral to written, yeah, I mean, yeah. yeah. It's a marvelous question. In fact, the, the Indian context is very much to the tension between the oral and the written, as I just mentioned, but there's a very famous verse in Sanskrit, um, uh, the knowledge which is contained in books, in the codex, right? Pustakasya uh, chayavidya is like your money in somebody else's pocket. When you need it most, it's not there. Right? Can you call that knowledge? Can you call that money? Wealth? Right? So there's a certain, certain tension always in the transition. But whereas I think in the, in the Western traditions, if uh, the writing was considered to be more stable and more act and more uh, less inclined to being um, tampered with the Indian tradition is the opposite they thought that the oral especially the early Vedic sacred literatures were devised with pitch and accent so you were pronounced in a certain way so if you messed up a pitch or an accent you could be shown to be making a mistake whereas the writing you can have scribal errors and they didn't trust the scribes but both of them were living side by side and the contemporary human thing there have been Sanskrit scholars up until the, they still exist, but there's fewer and fewer of them who are illiterate, but have memorized hundreds of texts and they have them in their brain and they, re, and they teach them and recite them and work with them in different sciences, but they're illiterate. So, and even when they use manuscripts, it was only as a crutch. They, so there's a large tension between that oral and the Sanskrit tradition, for sure. Uh, in Tamil and Greek. Yeah. yeah. Um, um, as far as Tamil is concerned, um, like um, Sanskrit, Sanskrit is a, a Shruti versus Smriti. There are two words. One you hear, one you remember. Um, most of the uh, Sanskrit tradition was uh, um, oral tradition. The oral tradition continued to exist. It never died. You know, when you look at uh, the priests in the temples, they, they don't read and uh, chant there. The everything comes out of their head. So that means the oral tradition is uh, continuing. Even though they were all written, but that didn't take that much work. But the oral tradition is always the dominant tradition. But the Tamil is concerned, um, you know, during the Sangam period, during the classical period, everything was written. They never had that oral tradition. So they used the Tamil Brahmi script. Um, they were all written in uh, Pandus. So they produced lots of families. Now uh, the, the tradition continued. The, um, when the script changes, they will continue to write the, the, the converted script. The, um, that those families were unearthed only in 19th century. Only then they were able to print them. Uh, until then, they were all having everything in the families. But during the Bhakti period, medieval period, uh, Bhakti literature dominated. Then they put all the Sangam literature, the classical literature, in the attic of the house. Almost in all, everybody's house in the attics, you will see a whole bunch of uh, families there. 
then the 19th century, one, one person went and looked at some of them and immediately he realized that sir, something is going on here. Then he brought them out, then printed them out. Now we are able to say Tamil is a classical language. Otherwise it wouldn't have happened at all. So that's how, you know, the oral tradition and the written tradition. Um, the, the great question is that it's a little bit complicated because uh, they went through several stages uh, historically. Um, the, the first, uh, well, the, the first known civilization for the Greeks were the Minoans in Crete, but they, they were technically Greek. Um, after that were the Mycenaeans. Um, and the Mycenaeans, um, we, for a long time, we didn't know what language they spoke. Now, the, 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 the dominance of the Mycenaeans ended roughly around the year 1200 BCE, uh, when uh, all over the Eastern Mediterranean there was a fairly catastrophic uh, series of events uh, which involved drought, possibly climate change. Um, there was a group of marauding people called the Sea People. We don't know either who they were. Uh, the major palaces in the Greek mainland, man, mainland were burned. This is the uh, alleged date of the fall of Troy. Uh, there was big trouble in Egypt. Um, so, uh, when and ap after this this period of a people ended, there was a cat. There was a fairly gargantuan decline in, in mortality. Sorry, in, in sorry, in life expectancy. Uh, they they and the Greeks lost among other things. They lost their writing. They became a purely oral culture for several hundred years until uh, roughly the late 8th century, which is also, as it happens, the time the Homeric poems uh, take the form that we know them, there is one school of thought which says that the Greeks reacquired an alphabet for the purpose of writing down the Homeric epics. Uh, if that's true, the inspiration probably came when Greeks were visiting the Hittite Empire and saw the Gilgamesh tablets. And said, oh, they wrote down their epic. Well, that's a good idea. So. Uh, Making an alphabet from scratch is a little bit difficult, right? So what they did is they borrowed the Phoenician alphabet, which is a Semitic alphabet, uh, very much like Hebrew, uh, and Semitic alphabets don't have vowels. Uh, and so the word, the first letters of the Greek uh, uh, alphabet, alpha, beta, um, were taken from uh, the Phoenicians. Um, and so what they did is they, they came up with ways to represent vowels. Mm. And so the, the Greek alphabet became thus the first alphabet which was um, fully slavic, which fully represented um, yeah. the, the, the sounds that a human voice makes. Now, uh, literacy was very, very limited for hundreds and hundreds of years, and we know that, um, uh, at least in Athens in the 6th and 5th centuries, um, uh, it caused a bit of rupture, because uh, people didn't, some people didn't like writing stuff down, and we know that, uh, that it was a bit controversial uh, for a couple of reasons. One, uh, there was a, a, a comedy, uh, uh, which we don't have, we just have a report of it called The Alphabet Tragedy, in which the, the members of the chorus, the chorus for a great play, sang and danced, uh, were dressed up as letters of the alphabet. All 24 of them, which sounds kind of funny. They, presumably they made words and stuff like that. And so, you know, people like Socrates, Socrates the philosopher, was illiterate himself. He didn't believe in it. He thought that writing made you, and stop me if you've heard this before, writing made people lazy, it hurt their memory. Sound familiar, right? Te a technology which uh, hurts the intellect, and if you, when you look at written words, they said the same thing back to you every time, so I'd much rather talk to a person and cross-examine them. Wow. So, so the, fir the first fully literate author uh, for the Greeks was Plato, uh, Socrates' student. So. Um, so you think about how this would have revolutionized uh, uh, human interactions, uh, really changed a lot of things. So. Hi. Yeah, I'd first like to say thank you to each of you for coming out here. Um, well, it's been very interesting listening to you talk about all your uh, unique fields. Um, first, I'd like to ask you, uh, well, it's more geared towards the Western civilization. What are the different forms of Latin uh, and their difference, like a spoken, theological, um, legal of sorts, and for that matter, uh, the different forms of Greek? But you mentioned that the Bible is written in a right. common form. Uh, 
<clears throat> with with Latin, it, it it tends to come from what era the text was composed. And medieval Latin um, is a bit like Koine Greek to classical Greek in the sense that the syntax is simplified. The vocabulary is, is very much the same, but 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 the, but the sentences are much easier to read. The the, the class the cl classical Latin tends to uh, involve what's called long periodic sentences, which have all kinds of um, inter interlocking, nested, relative clauses and things like that. So uh, the medievals got rid of that. So legal Latin is really derived more from from uh, church Latin, actually. Um, so because uh, uh, church Latin was very much concerned with law. Of course, the, the, our law is based on Roman law, and the Romans had their own legal systems as well. But 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 really, I, I'm. I hope I'm not oversimplifying this, but I would say that the, you know, church Latin is, is kind of more responsible for things like that. Uh, and was that, did that answer your question? I'm not really sure. Uh, pretty much. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but, but then I uh, asked about Greek. Oh, and Greek, again, Greek, uh, again, Greek, I said Greek, Greek uh, has a continuous 3,000-year uh, evolution um, to it. Uh, and, uh, uh, it's, it's presumably still still evolving. So uh, the Greeks kept their language despite losing their independence. I mean, they, they were allowed. Essentially, the Romans let them keep their language. They didn't insist that uh, when they when they over when they took over Greece, they didn't insist the Greeks speak Latin. Partly because they respected the Greeks culturally. So. You mean numerals? Yeah, I mean, do they count one, two, three, four? Do they and they all? If they do, do they all count the same way? I mean, or is there? I mean, like I, I think in, um, you know, um, a hatha Indonesian has been simplified, you know, so that you when they speak, you know, the, the two and above is one word and. Yes. You know, the singular is another way to say that. Yes. Well, well, Bahasa is, of course, linked with the Sanskrit. The word Bhasha is the Sanskrit yeah. word for language. But there is that um, from from 1 through uh, 10 is uh, like with English, right? Uh, you know, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Then from 11 uh, becomes uh, 10 plus 1, 10 plus 2, 10 plus 3 in the word. And 20 is another word. And 21. That's like, that's like Greek. Yeah. yeah. So this is the way yeah. these languages. Uh, for Dharma, I don't know. I know the Indo European language. I know Latin a little bit. So I know Latin, Latin and Greek are like that. Yeah. I don't know about um, It's the same. In, in Tamil, there is one difference, though. So once you get to 10, the, the, the 9 is the defective 10. So the hundreds, the 90 is the defective 100. So 100 yeah. minus 1. Yeah. It's a, it's a kind of a defective number. <laughs> so it's by Tamil word. But uh, that is how they conceptualized. So. Really quickly, you know, in, in, in Sanskrit, there's a whole ideology of language that the language that we know, that we speak, is only one fourth of language, capital L. And in fact, they connect it up with the ability to kind of reach deep into the, the sort of belly, the core of, of your ancient being. That if you can get to the, core, the highest level, they each call it the highest, but ah, you can actually understand the languages of all people and all animals and everybody. That it is a singular language that exists. That if you had enough uh, contact with it, it's it's the language we speak is only a fourth of what exists in the world. So that's the language that I want. <laughs> I was reading an article today. It was talking about Stoic philosophy. So you, when you you you. You are not really thinking about winning, you are thinking about losing before you try to win. So the same way, what if I didn't have a language to speak? 
No, um, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I would, I, I would not completely without a language, but I would think that, you know, the, I would always think about the language of the classical Tamil. You know, I, I would always want to be born a thousand years ago and speak their language and being one of the poets, you know, produce the poems. You know, that is what I would think. And it's not that I don't want to completely lose my language, but I want a different language, a different time. You know, that, that, that is the wonderful future about the classical language. The, you know, I don't think you can ever even think about the uh, poems being written the way it was written uh, a thousand years ago. So their life is completely different than now because we are so uh, mixed with so many things. It is not, uh, when I write a poem, I don't think I will be able to write a poem the way uh, a classical poet uh, wrote. So that is the something that I would be longing for. Uh, maybe Arabic. Uh, this is a rich literary tradition, and there's a lot of uh, Arabic commentary commentaries on Greek authors. So um, we picked impossibilities. You're picking something that you could actually open. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> maybe Norris. I'd like to read the uh, the uh, Norse epics. But. The sagas. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you guys very much thank for joining you. us. This